guys. So today we're going to be talking a little bit about religion and reform in the early 19th century. Um, so you should have a handout that looks a little bit like this. Um, so what we're kind of looking at here. So imagine where we are now. We're like the early 1800s up to like the 1830s. So America at this point is kind of in her adolescence, right? So like middle school. Kind of think about that age. So think about when, you know, you were in middle school. That's the time you're trying to kind of figure out, like, who you are, what you believe. Like, do I like what I look like? How can I change what I look like? Um, you know, should I start wearing makeup or change my style of clothing or... Um, you know, do I like the religion that my parents have always taken me to church? Do I like that religion? Um, what do I believe? Who am I? What kind of person am I am? Um, do I live up to my ideals? Do I have ideals? That kind of thing. So that's kind of where America is in this time period, trying to kind of figure out who America is, what does it mean to be American. Um, so we're going to be kind of looking at that a little bit today. Um, so this one's going to be a chunky one, it's a lot of information. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Um, so I want to start by looking at some of the religious movements of the early 1800s. So in this time period, period, we experienced the Second Great Awakening. So let's think back to the First Great Awakening, right? So this is in the colonial period, late 16, early 1700s, uh, where the Puritans are really kind of trying to come in and uh, make everybody Puritan, right? So here's the thing about Puritanism. Puritanism believes in something called predestination or Calvinism, where basically the idea is that God has already kind of like decided who's going to go to heaven, who's going to go to hell, even before you're even born. Um, and basically what you have to do is you have to act like one of these chosen people, right? And you live your life by these strict morals and standards and hopes that you are one of those chosen people. Um, so the second great awakening it's kind of in response to this old Puritan idea, um, and it's kind of this idea where we're going to reject some of those old ideas of religion. Um, so this one takes place, it starts in the late 1700s and into the early 1800s, um, and it rejects that idea of predestination and Calvinism, saying that as humans we have free will, okay? So God has given us this free will, so we have the idea to choose whether or not we're going to be saved. It's not about whether God has already chosen me. So they reject some of those um, principles of Puritanism. Um, what they do is they put faith in individual action. So it's what I, as an individual, can do to save um, myself, the choice that I have to make. Um, nobody makes that choice for me. It's not based on my parents' religion or my grandparents' religion or the fact that my dad was a preacher. Um, it's about a choice that you make, right? Like you have to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior or whatever. Um, that's kind of the idea of the second great awakening. Um, and so this one of the things that's important to understand is not all of the different religious groups agree on what that choice is. Some of them, you know, like I said, say you've got to accept Jesus. Some of them say like you have to be baptized in this certain way or you have to do this or you have to do that. But the point is it's an individual action, right? Um, one of the main kind of structures of this movement uh, is revivalism. So if you look at these pictures here, right, you can kind of get a good picture of what these revivals kind of look like. You see these guys, um, this guy's like on a stump, this guy is like in the middle of this wooden um, shed here. Uh, you see these are people who are outside. Um, revivals are kind of in the summer. It's a very emotional kind of preaching that's going on here. Um, sometimes they would be over like several days where people would travel to come to these revivals and meet. Um, so basically what's happening here is like, whoa, look at that guy. Um, it's all about this emotional preaching. Um, it's very emotion driven in this period uh, where there's this idea of this instant conversion. Like you can be converted in an absolute instant, right? By making that choice or doing whatever it is you need to do. Um, they would lead these revivals, like I said, over a several day period. Um, they would be outdoors. People would like sleep over outside to hear these preachings. And the preachings would eventually get more and more emotional as you go on, um, trying to lead to this conversion process. Uh, one of the most famous preachers is this guy down here. Oh, excuse me. His name is Charles D. Finney. So he's kind of one of these guys that would travel around um, to these different revivals and preach these different sermons. Uh, and that's kind of one of the essence of the Second Great Awakening. Um, now, of course, when you have something like this, there's always going to be a backlash movement to that. Um, and the backlash movement here is the Unitarians. Um, so the Unitarians 
don't really trust the Second Great Awakening and some of the things that they were saying. They kind of criticized that emotional revival, um, saying, like, that's just somebody getting caught up in emotions and emotions go away really quickly. Um, they very much distrusted emotion. Uh, instead, what they have is an appeal to reason, saying, like, well, you can logically explain religion, right? Like, if you look, um, there's this idea of, like, the intelligent design, right? Like, so you look at the human hand and um, what's going on in the way the human body functions. Like, that's logic, right? That's not emotional. Um, so Unitarians were more thoughtful, a little bit more intellectual than maybe some of the um, revivalist movements. They kind of also thought that conversion was more of a gradual process, like something that's going to happen um, over and over throughout your life, something you're constantly working towards. It's not something that's going to happen just as an instant. Um, they kind of mistrusted that, thought that like you're going to forget about that in three days, right? Um, whereas conversion... A true conversion is something that's going to take time. Their most famous preacher is this guy down here named Ellery Channing. Um, so, and even if you look at like ch churches that come out of this Unitarian tradition today, you're going to find that they're the more intellectual or scholarly based churches, um, as opposed to the uh, revivalist churches, which are going to be more like charismatic. Um, Think of like the Southern Baptist Church um, or the Pentecostal kind of tradition. That's going to be more the revivalist tradition. The last one that we have here is the AME Church. Um, so we have a lot of AME churches here in the South. You may have driven by them, um, but maybe you didn't know what it stood for. Um, so AME stands for the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Um, so that should already tell you right there that these are going to be black churches. Um, most of them are going to be in the North. And that's because in the South, a lot of um, the African Americans in the South, the slaves in the South, were not allowed to attend churches. Uh, Southern Owners were kind of like worried that they might hear, you know, about the book of Exodus where, you know, the slaves are led out of Egypt. Um, and so they don't really let African Americans in the South congregate together. But in the North, it was something that was acceptable for churches to, um, for African Americans to have kind of their own churches where they could congregate and worship together. Um, it's very much going to be in support of the abolition or the anti-slavery movement, which we're going to talk more about in just a minute here. Um, so obviously trying to kind of get slaves from the South to freedom, um, that sort of idea. And it becomes kind of the number one institution in the lives of free African Americans. And you think about this, it makes a lot of sense, because even in the North, Blacks were not allowed to have a lot of those freedoms, right? They weren't allowed to lead um, or have, like, leadership positions in other parts of the community, whereas in the church, they can lead, right? So it's going to be kind of the main institution for community, education, that sort of thing in the North for these free African Americans up there. Um, this guy right here is Richard Allen who is a former slave who escaped to the North. Uh, and he is the most famous preacher. He's actually the founder of the AME Church. He was the original um, African-American, or the AME preacher here. Uh, so this is going to be a really important institution, like I said, for people in the North, right? So these are some of the religious movements. Now let's take a look at some of the literary and artistic developments of this time. Um, so the first of these literary and artistic developments is transcendentalism. So transcendentalism is an interesting philosophical movement um, of the early 1800s, and it's very much a movement that values nature. It values the individual, um, like what can I do as a person to change things? Um, in terms of the church, it actually challenges the church a little bit, saying you can have a personal relationship with God. You don't even have to go to church in order to have a relationship with God. It can be something that's very personal between you and God or whatever God you believe in. Um, they kind of feel like the um, le like the leaders of the church are not very trustworthy. Um, two of these main people here that's part of this movement is Ralph Waldo Emerson, who's this guy down here, and Henry David Thoreau. Um, and so they kind of lead this movement um, where it's all about like what the individual can do, what the person can do, right? Uh, so Ralph Waldo Emerson just to kind of give you an idea of what that's like, he started to feel like society was too bureaucratic and there was too much like people trying to tell him what to do with his life. So what he does is he goes and lives by himself for two years in a, by a pond, right? He lives in this little cabin right here, teeny tiny little cabin on Walden Pond. He writes this big, long book about, you know, his experiences and what it's like to be an individual and what it's like to, you know, trust your instincts and do your own thing. 
Uh, but it's this idea that it's all about what can I do to improve myself, right? And separating yourself from the community itself. So that's transcendentalism. Um, the second one that we have here is romanticism, okay? So this is a literature movement, like I said. Um, but here's the thing about romanticism, okay? When you first see romanticism, you might get the idea like, mm, oh, I love you, I love you, I love you, right? That, that's not what romanticism is about, all right? So let's just look at these pictures here, okay? These are three uh, visual representations of three pretty famous romantic novels. So the first we have is Frankenstein, a book about taking dead bodies, parts, and sewing them together and creating a live human being through electricity. We've got The Telltale Heart, which is a short story, um, which is about a guy who murders another guy and buries him under the floorboard and then goes crazy thinking he hears his heart beating. And then up here, we have The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, which is a ghost story um, about a guy who is afraid of a ghost, a supposed ghost of a headless soldier and gets a pumpkin thrown at his head, right? Now, these are not happy stories, right? These are not love stories or romances, right? That's not what romanticism is really about. Romanticism is about kind of like this almost supernatural element that's a part of it, right? It's this focus on like the abstract, like not things that I can put my finger on, you know, something that I can't really explain what's happening to it, right? Like there's this, some sort of supernatural element that's involved. Um, it's very emotionally driven and you'll notice this is a trend, right? In these kind of movements. Um, it's very much about like how I feel and what it's like to feel. Um, it could be love, but it could also be fear, right? Uh, so just some really good examples are um, Nathaniel Hawthorne, which you may, if you've taken English yet, um, you may have read The Scarlet Letter. He wrote that. Um, one of his other short stories is called The Birthmark. Um, that's got a lot of kind of supernatural elements to it. Edgar Allan Poe, very much known for like the horror story genre. Um, the Telltale Heart, like I said, is one. Uh, Mary Shelley, she's actually a British author, but we're going to put her in here anyway because she works um, with Frankenstein. Washington Irving, who wrote The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. So these are all examples where you can't really explain what's going on, or if you can, it there's still like this big question. It doesn't make a lot of sense, right? That's what romanticism is really all about. Um, and the last one, you can put this in with romantic singer, is painting. Um, so romanticism in painting comes from a group called the Hudson River School. And this is not like a school like I went to the Hudson River College. This is like, think about like a school of fish, like a group of people who are all very similar. Um, so the Hudson River School artists are people who glorify nature. There's a lot of like nationalism involved in that. Um, a couple of the famous artists are Thomas Cole or James Fenimore Cooper. We're actually going to be talking a little bit more about this in class, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail right here. Um, but just kind of know that it's this glorification of nature, very similar to like the transcendentalist kind of movement. So you see kind of how all of these things come together, right? So you see a lot of similarities between these religious movements and these literary movements, this idea of emotion, um, of, you know, logic and reason playing a role. Uh, and really what this leads to is America coming to this understanding that the human being has the ability to improve itself, and what that's going to do is lead to some reform movements uh, throughout this period where they're basically taking a look at some of the major problems of society and saying, how can we fix these problems? So the first one is public education. So this is led by a guy named Horace Mann. That's him right there. And what he is saying is that we don't have public schools, right? That's not a thing that exists in the 1800s. So he's saying that in order to kind of improve ourselves, we need to encourage public schools, schools that are funded by the state, right? You don't have to pay to go to school. Um, so a couple things that he wants are mandatory attendance. So people have to go to school and get an education. Um, that there is a standard curriculum. So everybody's learning the same thing all over the state or all over the country, right? Uh, that they are tax supported. Again, this kind of goes into the idea that they are public. Um, they are funded by the state, right? Uh, and that teachers get training. Now, this may seem like an obvious, like, duh, of course teachers are going to get training. A lot of teachers had not been trained. They just were like people who needed a job and they're like, okay, here, go teach this class and read out of this book and that's how you're going to teach, right? Uh, so this is a pretty important movement in order to kind of make sure that there is a standard form of education. He really pushes for education. It becomes a big deal. Um, the second one that we have is prisons and asylums. Um, so prisons in this time period are kind of different than what we would think of today. It's not just for people who break the law. Pretty much a prison is for anybody that we want to 
get out of regular society. Um, this also might mean people who are declared insane, right? Uh, so Dorothea Dix um, is the one who kind of leads this movement and she raises awareness for kind of what's going on. So here's the thing, um, and we'll talk again a little bit more in depth about this in class, but people who were declared mentally ill, and this could be like everything from people that are super emotional to people that have depression, to people that might actually have like schizophrenia or something. And, you know, they don't understand psychological illness at this time. Um, the, they've been put into these asylums and the treatments that they were given were incredibly cruel, right? Um, so you don't have to write all of these down. You have to write this down. Um, the popular concept of the time is that people who are insane have a demon in them. And in order to get the demon out, you kind of have to beat the demon out. But of course, that means you have to beat the human being, right? Some of the things that they would do, these are what you don't have to do. So they would bleed them. They would put them in, like dunk them in cold, cold water, like fill a tub of cold, cold water and hold them under it. Um, they would give them electric shock therapy where they would basically just shock them with electricity. Uh, they would remove part of their brain. That's a lobotomy where they would like just cut a piece of your brain out. Um, they might take like burning hot irons and apply to your head. They might lower you into a pit of snakes. Um, if they didn't know what else to do, they might just shackle you to a wall and leave you there. Um, there's this really interesting one where they thought that if you, they spun you around really, really fast, like it would clear your head and like readjust you. So they would like put them on these machines that spun you super, super fast. Um, so much so like people would get sick and even get hurt from this. Uh, they might drill a hole into your skull to release the pressure in your skull. Uh, they might wrap you in like cold, wet sheets, right? Dwayne Sorry about Cohen. This. Dwayne Cohen. Would you come to the front office, please? So all of these things are done to kind of cure the person of mental illness. Uh, however, it really just made them worse, if not killed them outright. Um, so Dorothea Dix, what she does is she helps establish nine actual hospitals, right? Instead of just, you know, throwing a mental person in prison, um, someone who's mentally ill in prison actually have hospitals where they can treat them, right? One was established in North Carolina, the Dorothea Dix Hospital in Raleigh here. Um, this is one of those um, spinning machines that I was telling you about um, just a second ago. Um, but this is, becomes really important kind of like helping people who have problems rather than just hiding them away from society. Um, the next one we have are the utopian communities. Um, so one of the popular trends in this period was to create like these societies in order to create what are called perfect societies. Um, and it's this idea that we want to remove ourselves from actual society uh, in order to form kind of these like utopias, right? So think about like the perfect place, right? There's two groups of these. Some are the religious groups. There was a group called the Shakers and they get their name because like in, as part of their religious movement, they would have like these fits almost. Um, they would make money by like working together. Some of them were almost even early forms of communism right? Um, the Shakers, for example, were furniture makers, and they were well known as some of the best furniture makers out there, period. Um, some of them were not. Uh, another version of the religious um, are the Mormons. We're going to talk more about the Mormon church in class, um, so hold on to that idea, uh, but they are founded by Joseph Smith. Uh, so that's another one of these religious groups, uh, but as I said, some of them were intellectually based. They're not religious. A um, couple examples are New Harmony in Indiana or Brook Farm in New York. Um, so basically what these people would do is separate themselves from society uh, and live. Some of them would buy farms, like Brook Farm was a farm that was purchased. Um, and they would all live in these community houses and kind of work together. Like I said, some of them are almost like communism based where there's no like private property and nobody owns anything. Some of them got really weird and were like, everybody's married to everybody. So you can basically sleep with whoever you want in the society. And we all just raise the children together. And some of them just had some really off the wall ideas. Um, but, uh, as they kind of worked together, they thought they were creating these perfect societies, but human beings aren't perfect, right? So the non-religious ones kind of died out sooner uh, because there was a lot of like infighting. People didn't agree necessarily on how they should do it. Um, some of them didn't work very productive. So like they would have these farms and then people would be like, eh, I don't really want to work today. And so they wouldn't grow any food. And then if you don't grow any food, then you die, right? So 
Just as an example, Mormonism is still one of the fastest growing religions today, whereas New Harmony is only open for two years and Brook Farm is only open for six, right? So that just kind of gives you an idea of um, these movements and how they're kind of moving here. Um, next thing that we have is abolition, okay? So the abolition movement um, begins really almost as soon as slavery is outlawed in the North. Um, these are people who want to end slavery all over the country. OK, um, primarily it's going to be a northern movement, as you can imagine. Um, some uh, favor nonviolent ways of resistance. Uh, a couple examples of these are Frederick Douglass and William Lloyd Garrison. So Frederick Douglass is this man up here. He was a freed slave uh, or an escaped slave, rather, uh, who moves up north and becomes kind of one of the major voices of the time. Um, you might read the, Frederick, the narrative of Frederick Douglass in your English class. This other guy, William Lloyd Garrison, um, is the leader of a newspaper, an abolition newspaper called The Liberator. You might want to just write that down, The Liberator, uh, where he would write articles about kind of like the horrors of slavery, um, you know, kind of try to raise awareness of what was going on and kind of try to get the government to change things, right? But then, of course, there are some who favored violence. Um, we talked a little bit about this already, but... Um, there are some rebellions in, throughout the South of slaves who rise up. Um, basically, they say, like, you know, we're being mistreated. Nothing's changing. We have to take matters into our own hands. Um, so some examples are the Nat Turner and the David Walker rebellions. Um, the problem is, and you again, you might want to write this down. You need to know this. The problem with these rebellions is they are unsuccessful for the most part. So that's the first thing you need to know. They're unsuccessful. The second thing you should know is that they actually caused restrictions on African Americans. For example, the Nat Turner Rebellion. Um, before the Nat Turner Rebellion in Virginia, you could teach slaves to read or write. After Nat Turner's Rebellion in Virginia, they outlawed that because they're saying like, oh, we don't want slaves to be able to send messages to each other. So they would outlaw education. Um, so rebellion sometimes backfired, okay? So that's the two things you need to know. Usually unsuccessful oftentimes backfired onto the people. Um, sorry again. Dwayne Cohen? Dwayne Cohen. He needs to go where he needs Come to go. Come to the front office, please. So um, this is kind of part of the abolition movement here, and this is going to continue to grow. In the 1820s, it's a very small movement, but by 1860, and we get closer to the Civil War, you're going to see that it gets much bigger. Um, the last one we're going to talk about here is women's rights, okay? Um, so in the 1820s, women didn't really have a major role in society. Um, there's this idea called the cult of domesticity. And the idea behind this is keep women at home. That's kind of where they belong in the domestic realm, right? Uh, women have very few rights. Uh, they are kind of seen as the moral force in society. Like if you want to know what's right, you look to women. The problem is women who break that moral standard, like maybe a woman who sleeps with a man before they get married, um, is shunned from society. The problem is there's this double standard, right? Men can go and pretty much do whatever they want, but women, if they do the same thing, they're seen as like a scarlet woman, right? Think about the book, The Scarlet Letter, if you've read that, um, where it's the woman who is the one that has to go out and live with the woods and wear the scarlet letter on her chest, right? So women kind of get involved in a couple movements here. Um, the first that they get involved with is the temperance movement. This is the anti-alcohol movement. Basically, they say that um, temperate or that alcohol is kind of like um, the cause of all of the ills of society. So if you look at this, like men go out and they spend all their money and they get drunk and then they come home and they beat their wives and their children. And, you know, it's all because of alcohol. Right. So there's this big movement led primarily by women to try and ban alcohol right? Um, the Grimke sisters are a major force of that movement. There is also the abolition movement that a lot of women are involved with. Um, one of these women is a woman named Sojourner Truth, who was again an escaped slave. Uh, and she gives this really famous speech where she says, ain't I a woman, right? That's the name of the speech where she says, you know, like, I've done this, I've seen my children, I've raised children, and I've seen them sold to other people, and I have escaped slavery, and I have done all these amazing things, and I'm a woman, ain't I a woman, right? So, so Jenner Truth and the Grimke sisters are really trying to kind of say that women are able to do these things if we would let them, right? Um, this leads to a couple big events here. Um, in New York City, in Seneca Falls, New York, a women's rights convention is held um, by 
a lot of these women. They issue what's called a Declaration of Rights and Grievances. And basically what they do is they model it on the Declaration of Independence. And it says, like, these are the rights women should have, right? These are the things we should be allowed to do as women in this country, calling for protection from the law, saying, like, you know, we deserve protection just as much as men do. We deserve the same rights that men do. Um, so we're going to see this is the beginning of this women's rights movement. Uh, and it's really important here. Um, so that kind of, oops, sorry about that. So that kind of ends up where we are talking about today is America is really trying to find their own place in society and what they're looking for here. Um, so that's kind of the thing to remember here. America is a teenager, right? America is trying to find its place in the world. Um, so think about like what that means for America. So we're going to go more in depth into some of these things in class. Until then, see you later. Bye.